This is your host, Vaughn Sigmund, and you're listening to the Business Mechanic Show here on BPM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We're also streaming live right now on YouTube, so join us at Vaughn Sigmund, the Business Mechanic. Love to have you join me while you're on there. Don't mind if you subscribe, too. Today's show, we're going to talk about timeless business principles of exceptional businesses. Let me start out with a little bit of background, make sure everybody understands I'm a business coach and a facilitator for the Alternative Board here in Southern California. I'd like to take just a moment to explain how we at TAB arrived at these timeless business principles. And then I'm going to discuss several of these key principles that I think truly great businesses practices. But before I get started, I want to call attention to the takeaways. There's going to be a lot of takeaways from this. And they're going. You know, if you're driving in your car, listen to this as a podcast, you may not have a piece of paper close by. If you've got some takeaways in this, it's all in a book. Timeless Business Principles. Be more than happy to send you a copy of this for free. Contact me at vsigmund.com. It's V as in Victor, S as in Sam, I-G-M-O-M. Be more than happy to send you over a copy for free. So let me tell you a little bit about the alternative or tab. We've been working with CEOs and business owners since 1992. And as our 25th anniversary was approaching, we wanted to create something special. And since we've worked with over 30,000 businesses and their owners over the years, our idea was to determine the most important things private businesses could do to lead to lasting success. And we went out and we interviewed our longest term business owners, some of the facilitators like myself. And the result is the Timeless Principles book. And in the discussion today, I'm going to touch on eight of the most important principles that we recommend for owners. And I'm not going to have a chance to go into a whole lot of detail, but I do expect that some really good ideas and some takeaways are going to come from the presentation. And we'll start with three very, very important principles, starting with your value proposition. What is a unique value proposition? He says plainly, what is a unique value proposition? Well, not to be condescending, but in case you don't fully understand what it is, it's a, it's a business differentiator. When you differentiate, differentiate your business, People remember you, and when they remember you, they end up spreading the word about your business. So let me put all this into a story for you. There was a, a woman in Florida who one morning comes down to her kitchen, opens the cabinet, the cupboards under the kitchen sink, and if anybody's ever spent any time in Florida, they've got some gigantic bugs there. And she opens this sink up, or the cupboard under the sink, and she sees roaches, these gigantic palmetto bugs. She freaks, slams the door shut, runs over to her computer, types in Google's exterminator. First name that comes up, she picks up the, the phone, calls him up. About an hour later, the exterminator shows up, shows him where the problem is. He goes in, does his thing, gives her a bill, and leaves. Bugs are dead. She's pretty happy. About three months later, she goes back to this same cabinet, opens it up, the bugs are back. Freaks out, closes the doors. She can't really remember who that first exterminator was. Didn't really stand out. So she Googles again, sees another name, calls him on the phone. About an hour later, he shows up in a perfectly pressed and clean uniform work truck that is spotless out in the driveway, says to her, ma'am, I'm so, so sorry we have to meet under these circumstances, but let's get this resolved for you. Show me where the problem is, I'll get it taken care of, and I'll be out of your hair shortly. So she takes him back to the kitchen, shows him where the problem is, she said, ma'am, I'm going to take care of this. Go do whatever you were doing. I'll come find you when I'm finished. So he goes to work, does his thing, comes and finds the homeowner, gives her a bill, assures her, ma'am, 
if at any time in the next six months these bugs come back, you call me and I'll come back and treat for free. Again, I'm sorry you're having the problem. Thank you very much for your business. And he leaves. Not much different than the first guy. But when she walks back into the kitchen, next to the sink is a thank you card and a red rose. Who do you think she remembered the next time she needed an exterminator? Who do you think she would recommend if the word exterminator ever came up? Of course. So you need to develop as your unique value prop your own red rose. And step one, in order to be able to determine what your red rose is going to be, you need to understand what your competitors are doing. How do they provide service that's better or different than you do? Can you, can you glean or determine from, from mystery shopping or from speaking to their customers, your customers, their suppliers, what they do that may be outstanding, what they don't do is what you're really looking for. And then determine what you can do to stand out compared to them. And the, and the key to developing this signature element is it's, it, it, it must, it must separate you from every other provider that serves your same customers with your goods or services. Another quick example, I'll give you one of our members, Tim Allman of Sierra Western Home Loans. His red rose is making house calls. He's found through the years that the best way to understand a client's goal, what they need, is to find a good match for them with the right mortgage. And so he comes to their home, sits at their kitchen table where it's nice and comfortable, it's a nice, comfortable space for the customer. And he discusses this, this really important transaction for them. So I ask you to take some, take some time in the coming days, maybe weeks, and give it some thought. And think about what might become the red rose for your business. It's that one thing, like Curly said in, in um, uh, the, you know, the movie, it's the one thing, City Slickers, that's the movie. It's the one thing that makes you stand out. Now, when I ask business owners and CEOs when I first meet them, what makes them stand out against their competition, almost always the word customer service comes up. And I get it. In their mind, they're, they're just better at taking care of the customers. Then... My follow-up question to that is, are you surveying your customers to determine for sure that that's really the case? And most often the response is no. Now they again, in their minds, give great customer service, but they've never verified it. They've never verified with their customers, which is the critical part of it. You don't want to fool yourself. Most companies don't survey the customers, and I'm here to tell you that doing so is a key business principle. It's not hard. It's not expensive. It's just a routine you've got to get into, but it's a vital routine. It's a vital behavior. Use a company like SurveyMonkey or, or uh, SurveyGizmo. That's another good one that I've used. Develop a process. Reach out to your customers. Take their temperature. Take the temperature of your true performance in the eye of the customer, not in yours, not your assumptions. But what are you looking for in those responses? That's a big question. How should it be structured? What questions should you ask? Because when you get those responses, you're going to need to score them. And I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to how you score these things. And the way you do it the best way to do it is the net promoter scores. So you want to have raving fans because those raving fans are your promoters. And the good news is that those promoters are the people that are out there speaking highly. You 
and your organization, your services or goods without you ever knowing it. And that's where the net promoter score comes in. And there's one ultimate question. You should be asking them multiple questions, five to ten. But the ultimate question, which is the name of a book, by the way, the ultimate question. The ultimate question is on a scale of one to ten, what is the likelihood that you would recommend our company to a friend or colleague? On a scale of 1 to 10, what is the likelihood that you would recommend our company to a friend or a colleague? And what this does is it identifies how loyal a company's customers are, of course. And that's called the MPS or the Net Promoter Score. And have you been asked this question before? I bet you have. It's all, if, if somebody sent out surveys and they're not asking this question, they're wasting their time because it's the question you have to ask. So you're going to determine who your promoters are, who your detractors are. And here's how you score for promoters. You identify the percentage of customers who rank you on a scale of 10, a 9, a 10. Those are your promoters. And then your detractors. Those are the customers that give you a 1 to a 6. Those are your detractors. Sevens and eights or neutrals, you can throw them out. They don't mean anything. You're looking for raving fans. And you're looking for strong detractors. And the more raving fans you have, that drives up your net promoter score, creates more word of mouth, silent sell, or not silent, but uh, unpaid salespeople for you. The best companies in the world, when they determine their net promoter score, they're in the high 90s. And I've, I've been fortunate enough, I work for those, and I've lived and I've executed those approaches and processes. And with a couple of those companies, been able to achieve the top 2% in net promoter scores. And I, and I tell you that because I don't want anyone to ever think I'm just repeating something I read out of a book. Now, I've read question. That's, that's a mandatory reading for any business owner or CDO. But I've also worked with thousands of managers and employees who I was responsible for to achieve really high NPRs. So you want to be able to reach out and truly understand what your customers are saying about you. It's critical. And if you don't have enough promoters, if you're not in the 85 reaching for the 90s, how do you, how do you build them? Well, that's a very good question. You, 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 the thing you've got to do is blow your customers away and then stand out in whatever field you're in, however competitive it is. I'll give you a few examples. Car dealers. Some car dealers give free car washes, free airport shuttle, free airport parking. I've got a friend that about a year ago, I was helping him uh, buy a new Lexus. People ask me to do that every now and then because of my background. And he really wanted to buy it from a dealer that was uh, not too far from him, that offered free airport parking, free shuttle service to the airport. He travels a lot. Car washes. And he, was, he really was willing to pay a lot more for that Lexus to be able to buy from that dealer because of those services. There was a, a dealer 10 miles away. I could get, I think the car was $2,500 cheaper, but he was willing to spend that extra couple grand to buy from that dealer that gave him those perks that stood out from their competition. So customers are really willing to pay more for your goods or services if you stand out from the competition, if you're giving them those extras. And that's, that's why, it's, it's why it's so important. Because what this Lexus dealer that offered these services, they've done is they created their red rose. They understood that they have a, a customer that has a need and they have a high value on these kind of services. So they offered it to them for free. It's an awesome thing. So the, the next thing you have to determine 
in order to create your differentiator comes from another book, Start With Why. Start With Why from Simon Sinek. And that helps you understand how to build raving fans, your net promoters. It, it helps you understand how to compel more of your customers to be promoters. The leading theory for creating loyal customers is starting with the why. Now, I can tell you most companies that I've met and worked with, they can early on articulate what the, they do and how they do it. But usually they cannot articulate a true why, why they do it. But when you can, you can identify and, and boil down to that why, that provides the emotional connection with prospects. And Rene Descartes, who's the father of modern philosophy, he famously said, I think, therefore I am. But neuroscience, which I'm a huge fan of, has found that we're, we're not thinking machines, we're feeling machines. And uh, it, we, we make decisions based on emotion and then later justify it with logic. Therefore, articulating your why or creating a service that's around your why is foremost. I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of a longer story here. It's based on a company I used to work with years ago, Kohl's Department Stores, which created back in the 90s a very unusual approach compared to the rest of the department store chain who were their competitors. They needed to stand out. They started out in the same space that Macy's and Dillard's and Penny's and Sears all started out in. Kohl's was going to go on an expansion program and they knew they needed to be better than their competition in some way. So they studied their customers and determined some true high value needs of the customers. And from that, they created a whole new design and approach to the department store. They were built around the why. And when you first walk into a, a Kohl's, and one of the reasons why they have such a huge loyalty from their customers, you'll see the minute you walk in, but it may not be that obvious to you. You see the registers in the checkout and the, right, right there at the front door. It's very different from traditional discount or department stores. It's much like a discount store. But why is it that, that Kohl's broke from the traditional department stores to locate the registers to the front so differently than in competitors? See, Kohl's was built to solve a common problem for its targeted customer who was a female working shopper. And they're generally very pressed for that one thing they can never get more of, and that's time. And Cole's approach is, if we can become the easiest place to shop, saving our customers that one thing they can't make any more of, and that's time, by making it real easy to find what you're looking for, sell it to you at a competitive price, and then get out of the store with a minimum amount of, of wait time, especially on the, on the paying for it, the transaction, the, the ringing you up, you're going to gain net promoters. And you know what they do? If you think about Macy's and Pe Penny's and Sears, who are all having, they, they ended calling it 88 because it had some association with Hitler. But, but um, anyway, so if you were a cashier, you saw more than three people, you got on the blower, and you called out a, a code 88. And their infrastructure was built so that if, if you heard a code 88 and you were on the code 88 schedule, they had a whole code 88 schedule for everybody working in the store during certain times of the day, your schedule said that if you heard an 88, you had to come and open a register. Everybody's cross-trained to open registers there. You drop what you're doing, you go open a register because that is their red rose. We're not going to make you wait in a long line to get your transaction completed. They use a lot of the historical data, predictive modeling to make sure they have enough people scheduled, to have registers open at the right time. 
but in when the, in the in, in undetermined times when it gets backed up, they couldn't predict that. They've got this 8-8 backup. So they process those customers much faster than their competition, saving their customer time. A couple other things they do. The returns are not processed at the cash registers. You go to another department. Who has not rolled their eyes when they were behind somebody returning something? Gigantic pain. Now, uh, everyone at Kohl's knows that you know, they're on sale all the time and there's about 1,500 racks in a Kohl's and this is another differentiator for them. This is another red rose that you may or may not be aware of. So there's about 1,500 racks. Everything's always on sale. Sometimes things get missed. But at Kohl's, really, the customer is always right. And so if you get up to a register, cashier is ringing it up, and a different price comes up than what you think you saw back on that rack you picked it up from, that, that employee, that cashier is empowered to change the price on the spot, whatever the customer says. Do they get taken advantage of? Yeah, from time to time, but it's, it's all part of their red rose. It's their differentiator. It's key to them owning the loyalty of their customers. So there's, there's no calling back to a department. There's no holding up a line. There's no extra hassle. They just give you the price. They figure at some point it's going to be that price anyway. So I hold up a customer. Why take the chance of making a customer mad at them? They just give them the price and move on. And so anyway, everything at Kohl's, everything at Kohl's from a customer's viewpoint is done around saving their customers money. They're not in malls. That way you can park up close, walk in, find what you want, get out, easy checkout, no hassles. So it is a huge, huge advantage that Kohl's has built into their DNA that is their red rose. Think about some other companies that have created differentiators in their, in their industries. Uber, they've crushed the taxi business because they make it so easy to get a ride somewhere. It's an app. There's no anxiety wondering whether somebody's going to show up or not. You've got the name and the phone number of the person and a picture of their car and them that's coming to pick you up. You can see them on a map when they're going to be there. It's a nice, clean car with generally a very pleasant person to talk to driving it. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Tom Shoes. Tom Shoes, which is um, uh, a company you may or may not be familiar with, but for every pair of shoes they sell, they give a pair to a person in need. It's another unique value prop that they have that is a real big feel good. You, you can feel good about buying from them because you're giving back through the purchase that you're making. And this, you know, that's another great way as you take this social approach. That's really smart. It's really smart in many ways. You know, make, making your business a vehicle to improve people's lives, that resonates with a lot of people. And now, you know, not everyone has this world-changing, altruistic approach about why. It doesn't have to be that way. You can do it the Coles way. You can do it the Lexus way. You know, find your way. So I'm going to take a break here. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some other things around value propositions and how to build that. We're going to talk about branding, which is very, very important. So give me a few minutes. We're going to take some commercial breaks and we'll be right back. Thanks. This is your host, Vaughn Sigmund, and you're listening to the Business Mechanic Show here on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We're also streaming live right now on YouTube, so join me there. Appreciate it. If you wouldn't mind subscribing while you're in there, getting lots of views now. I'm really excited about that. So we're talking about timeless business principles, and I'm going to share a few more with you that I find of very high quality that our very best business owners are using in order to be as successful as possible. So let's talk a little bit about finishing up with your value proposition. And that's once you finally established your why, 
The best way to convey it is through stories. Stories that bring the why to life. These stories, they, they need to create that emotional connection between you and your customers and why. And your why. And these customers, once you make that connection and they buy into that why, they're, they're raving fans, they're going to be your promoters. And when you think about telling stories, in, in my opinion, the best storyteller on the planet is Pixar may argue with me, but I, I think they tell an amazing story. They've created so one, so many number one hits. You know, their technology is one up, but they also they tell great stories. You know, uh, Emma Coates, who's a former story artist with, with Pixar, identified that every Pixar story follows the same template. Here's your template. And with a little creativity, you can use the same template to convey your thoughts about your why. Again, this is in our book, Timeless Business Principles. If you want a copy of it, vsigma.com, send me a note. I'd be happy to send you a free copy of it. But here's the template. Once upon a time, every day or one day, because of that, because of that, until finally, beginning, middle, end, tells a story. So moving on to the next part of this whole, this whole principle around the why, unique value proposition, we got to talk about branding and the value of a strong brand and that brand standing out above your competitors. And we were a little surprised. We, we recently asked our, our highly experienced business owners that we work with, what they would have done differently when launching their business if they knew then what they know now. And the area, you know, in the area of marketing, we were surprised to find that the number one by mile response was focusing more on the brand. And I got to tell you, brand is not a well understood concept. But let me tell you how Jeff Bezos describes it. He describes it as your brand is formed primarily not by what your company says about itself, but what the company does. Your brand is what people say when you're not in the room. And of course, if you don't know who Jim, Jeff Bezos is, he's the founder and CEO of Amazon, who's done okay with his brand. Um, and you know, a strong brand, well, it kind of pre-sells a product or a service. It draws people to you. It lowers the cost of admission for them to do business with you. And like I was saying earlier with the Lexus dealership, customers are willing to pay more for a strong brand. That Lexus dealer, they are a Lexus dealer, but there's lots of Lexus dealers. There's lots of people selling that same product. They stood out because they had built their own brand under a brand. And customers of a strong brand, well, guess what? They have a higher retention. They stick around and do business with you longer. Customers who, they'll, they'll, pre they'll purchase more products and services from a strong brand. Think about your favorite places to shop. Your favorite brands to purchase from. In fact, this in, in quarter one of 2015, this is a couple years ago, but in quarter one of 2015, Apple only had 20% of the global smartphone sales. 20%. Yet it earns 92% of the profit. 20% of the sales, 92% of the profit. That's according to Wall Street Journal. People don't want, <laughs> this is a good one. People don't want to buy a quarter inch drill. They want to buy a quarter inch hole. Brand is not what you do, but the value that customers receive from your product or service. Strong brands are built around a brand promise. 
making the promise and keeping that promise. And if a brand is a promise, then a great brand is a promise kept. Strong branding is really complex and not one that I, I certainly am not a, an expert on. I just know one when I see it. I can't fully cover all that here. But here are a few tips about, I do know that work, about how to achieve a strong brand. Start with the value of product. Start with the value of product or your services. How much value you give your customer. Identify your differentiator, your red rose, and the words you want to be known for. Make a brand promise. Communicate that through your stories. And then most importantly, keep your promise. And by doing all that, you're going to exceed your company or your customer's expectations. Exceed your customer's expectations. Now, the next business principle I'd love to talk about, one of my favorites, is culture. So who out there would say your company has a definitive culture? Well, the truth is that every single one of your companies has a well-defined culture. Every company has a way we do things around here. Now, that culture may be great or it may not be so good, good or bad. You have a culture, and, I, and I'm sorry to tell you this, but about 70% of you, your employees don't think much of your culture, and that's according to Gallup, because 70% of the American workforce is disengaged from their company, your company, at some level. And one thing we've learned, we at TAB over the years, is that a company's culture is largely defined by the behavior and the style of the owner or the CEO. Because the employees look to the owner or you, the owner or the CEO, for how they should behave. And they try to do things like you do. And let me just give you a quick example of that. If you're a very detailed person, chances are even your least detailed people will bring data to support their ideas because they know that's how to win you over. And if you, if you happen to be a CEO or a business owner that loves a fun culture and brings that fun culture to the office, even your most introverted employees were, will, will participate in that. But if your culture is not what you want it to be, how do you create the culture that you want it to be, that you desire it to be? Here's one that is a, a tough pill for many business owners to follow, but I'm going to tell you a story. And it's a story about Gandhi. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing a Gandhi story during a business show. So the story goes like this. There was a young boy who was with, just obsessed with eating sugar. And his mother was pleading with him, was putting all kinds of effort and to get him to stop or to slow down. And the mother finally she got desperate and she decided to take him to visit his idol, the little boy's idol, who was Gandhi. And she was hoping he could, that Gandhi could help break the boy of his, of his sugar habit. So the mother and son, they walked for miles in the scorching heat to Gandhi's ashram. And then when they met the leader, the mother says, my son consumes too much sugar. Will you please tell him it's bad for his health? And Gandhi thought about her request and told them, return in two weeks. And the mother, she was a little perplexed by this, that, that Gandhi didn't immediately admonish her son as she expected him to. She didn't expunish, admonish this boy's bad behavior. But she did as she was instructed. She went away for two weeks. So they went through the whole trip again two weeks later. And when she arrived back in front of Gandhi, Gandhi looks directly at the boy and says, Boy, you should stop eating sugar. It's not bad for you. I'm sorry. You should stop eating sugar. It's not good for you. And the boy, and this is all lie, folks. It's not good for you. And the boy nodded 
and said he would do his best to stop. But the mother was still puzzled, and she turned to Gandhi and asked, Why didn't you just tell my son to stop eating sugar two weeks ago? To which Gandhi smiled and replied back to her, Two weeks ago, I had the same obsession with sugar, and I needed time to cut it back myself. So that all that leads to the moral to the story. She got as a CEO, as a manager, as a boss. If you want to be a great leader, business owner, you got to lead by example. I have another whole show and video on how to create the most successful culture in the world. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. It's, you know, it, but it starts, it starts at the top. It starts with you, the CEO. You can't legislate it. You can't delegate it. It starts with you. You've got to be committed to setting the tone of the culture within your organization. Don't get me wrong. I'm not asking everyone to behave like Gandhi to run a successful company. Far from it. But you, you need to know. You need to know that you got to set the example. You have to be it. You have to live it. You have to commit to it as a leader. Then you got to live it. And be it yourself. Lead by example. So next, let's talk a little bit about improving the effectiveness of your time. Again, I did a whole show on this, but I'm going to touch on this because it is a very important business principle. Because time and money and people are the main resources in your business. And which which of the three, which of those three, time, money, and people, which of the three do you have the most control over? Time. And even though it passes by steadily, we do have control over how much we spend it. And to start to get a handle on time management, step one, here's my advice to you and the advice we got from the business owners we work with over the years. Step one is you... You have to build a list of what we call platinum activities. And these are the things that bring the greatest value to your business. The things that you do that provides the greatest value to your business. One example of that might be creating a strategic plan. Or establishing an improved culture. Or building strategic partnerships. Creating your unique value proposition. That's really important. It's something you need to spend time on that's going to have the biggest impact on your organization, on your company, on the future success of it. Platinum activities. But the next step in all this, in order to spend as much time, the maximum amount of time you can that is allowed on your platinum, is you've got to have a to-don't list. And if, if you take one thing out of this, what we're talking about today, when you get back to your office, or if you're listening at your office, pull out a piece of paper, write at the top of that piece of paper, to don't list, keep it handy. And every time during the course of a day, you, you, you find yourself doing something that could easily be done by someone else, write it down on the to don't list. And over time, you're going to start to find other people to offload some of these tasks to. It's really important. It's vital. And step three of all this time management is to designate a time of day as your prime time. How many of you are morning people? Well, if you are, your prime time should be first thing in the morning. And during your prime time, whether it's early in the morning, late at night, middle of the afternoon, whenever it is, that's when you work on your platinum activities, when you're most productive. So during that time, you shouldn't be reading emails. You shouldn't be taking phone calls. You've got to be committed to only working on your platinum activities during prime time. And the next eye opener that I find is hugely impactful to everybody I work with. Determine what you as an executive or business owner get paid on an hourly basis. And then during the course of your day, determine not only what you are doing, but what is what you're doing 
worth the rate of pay that you're making to do this work. And I got to tell you, by following a very simple formula like this, you'll spend more time on your platinum activities and thereby you'll, you'll potentially have a much greater impact on your business. Maybe you got to commit to it. You know, I, I find lots of business owners, they, they, they rather have, they, they, that rather than serving as the owner of the business, what they've ended up doing is they found that they, they really just created a job for themselves. And that's really not why you wanted to start this business. So back to platinum activities, this example I just talked about on the hourly rate. This example I'm going to talk about is from a TAB member in Long Island. And his partner had, had set the value of her time at $450 per hour. And a few weeks later, she, she volunteered, the partner volunteered to pick up some, some pliers, some suppliers from the airport, which took three hours, three hours out of the day, which was a very nice gesture. It was three hours at $450 per hour. And when the partner pointed out that she was working way below her pay grade, next time she insisted on booking a car service for 220 bucks. And she kept all that valuable time working on more important items. And that, that extra time was probably worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,350. So the return on investment for that little scenario is about 600%. And that speaks very powerfully to the value of the concept of, of being able to identify what your, your platinum activities are. Now, here's a classic David and Goliath story. It's a modern day equivalent, which is either Uber or Airbnb, disrupting the massive log, lodging industry. And how, and it goes to the next thing is David and Goliath. How many folks are operating on their business from a strategic plan? I see a few hands out there. Not many. And if you've raised your hand, you say, yeah, I'm working off a strategic plan. Is it written? Is it a written strategic plan? Because a lot of people think a plan can exist in their head. Not true, my friends. Not true. But if you do have actually a, a written strategic plan, you're in a very select group. Trust me, 90% of the people I come across do not have it in writing. They do after they start working with me, but they don't when I first start working with them. Too many businesses operate from the tyranny of the urgent, which is all time management, instead of from a strategic plan. In the, uh, another great book, in the Stephen Covey uh, Time Management Matrix, these items are what they call urgent, but not important. We move now to the next principle, which is strategy, which is very important. I find that strategy is the, one of the most misunderstood terms in business. And let me start with another story. Who is familiar with Hannibal of Carthage? No, not the mass murderer, but the, the great general. If you're not familiar, here's, here's what Hannibal of Carthage did in the, in the third century BC. This was a while ago. Rome was still rising to be the empire it was to become. And in the Mediterranean, it was, it was competing for control with the, what was seemingly insignificant city-state of Carthage. And they engaged in a series of wars called the Punic Wars. And Carthage, Carthage's efforts in the Second Punic War, well, that was led by Hannibal, Hannibal of Carthage. And Hannibal was able to shock the Romans by marching thousands of troops and quite a few elephants, first over the Pyrenees Mountains and then over the Alps. And this, this culminated in the Battle of Cannae, where Hannibal lured the the much larger, significantly larger Roman army to attack the center. And then in turn, he attacked the Romans from the sides and from behind. Classic strategy that's still used today in many, many ways. 
And, and Hannibal's approach resulted in the single greatest loss of life in a single battle in the history of warfare. And Hannibal, by the way, because of his strategic ability, he never lost a major battle. He was labeled by his biographer as the father of strategy. And that truly is the ultimate David and Goliath story. And it's, it's, there's lots of great strategy and turnaround stories out there. Lego is another one of those. Uh, we've got all those in our book, Timeless Business Principles. You can reach out to me for that. But let me finish up with strategies now. That A good strategy has three elements. A diagnosis. That diagnosis defines the nature of the challenge. Second step, the second element, is a guiding policy for dealing with that challenge. And the third is a set of coherent actions to carry out the guiding policy. That guiding policy gives your employees a frame of reference for making decisions. And we ask, again, our business owners, our TAB members early on to take some time to reflect on why they started their business in the first place. Then we create a personal vision for them. And then we help them create a business vision to help them drive and achieve their personal vision. That's getting back to why they started that business. And, it, and chances are that uh, if you don't have a, a very well-constructed strategic plan, you're rarely, if ever, going to get there, get to where you want to get. And for those of you who have a plan, it often does not align with your personal vision of success. We've got to get that aligned. It's critical. It's like trying to ride a bike when the front and real, rear wheels are not aligned. It's really hard. It's going to take you much longer to get there. And like Jack Welch said, anybody can manage short. Anybody can manage long. But balancing those two things, that's what management is. And understand, too, that strategic plans are not just multi-year plans. For private businesses, it involves working on the right short-term activities with an eye towards the future. And an owner who runs their business using a strategic plan realizes they are using a, a GPS rather than looking in their rearview mirror. That's a much better way to run your business. So we're going to go to another break here. When we come back, we're going to talk about the game of work, and KPIs. You don't want to miss this. Stick with me. We'll be right back. This is your host, Vaughn Sigmund, and you're listening to the Business Mechanic Show here on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We're also live right now on YouTube, so thanks all of you for joining me. Let's talk about key performance measures or key performance indicators. I'm going to start with a, a quick story from The Game of Work, which, again, is a must-read business book. And this story is about Charles Schwab, who ran Bethlehem Steel in the early 1900s. And Schwab, he had one mill manager whose people were not producing very well. And unfortunately... This manager did not have a good answer as to why his mill was not producing very well. And Schwab, he got frustrated. And he asked one of the employees there, how many steel batches in a shift were produced that day? The man said six. Which Schwab then, Schwab then took a piece of chalk, wrote it on the ground prominently. Later that night, the night shift came in. And asked, what's this six? What's this six on the floor mean? And Schwab walked through the mill the next day and found that that six had been rubbed out and replaced with a seven. The day crew came in and saw that the night crew had outproduced them. So the day crew, they, they all banded together. It's a true story. They all banded together and they produced 10 batches that day. And they wrote that on the floor. So 
on and on. It, it wasn't long before this, this mill was cranking out more steel than every, every other plant. So that's what a KPI, that's the value and the power of having key performance indicators or metrics in your business. You have to keep score. How boring would any sports game be with no score? And work is no different. It works the same way. You have to have a numeric score and targets and someone, the employer, has got to keep score. And they've got, to, they've got to communicate that score as to how the team is achieving. That's the value of KPIs. They're just simple numbers or ratios that, that, that in the end, they convey a lot of great information. It creates a clear understanding of, of what's expected of them. And then a measure for how the team, the employees of the company are performing to that expectation, just like Bethlehem Steel. There's, and believe me, there's nothing wrong with healthy competition. Because healthy competition drives productivity. And if you want to start, if you don't have KPIs and you want to start utilizing KPIs, you got, you got to figure what you can measure. There's a lot of potential KPIs in every organization. They vary by industry. But... I, I encourage you to only start with three to five. Don't make it too overwhelming. Don't make it too many. Start with three to five. Work on them. You can add a few more later. And then make sure as you start tracking them, you got to be very accurate with the data you collect. And then you got to produce regular reports and communications around how the team is producing to these KPIs. Share the results. Or share the results widely. Not just to a, a select team, everybody needs to know about it. And I got to tell you, that's going to, that's going to lead to a more objective and predictable business. It always does. I've never seen it fail. So the last principle that I'm going to discuss is about planning the exit of your business. Exit of your business. So every owner is going to exit their business one way or the other. And our experience is that it's much preferred that, that plan, they, they plan that early and on their terms. As my partner down in, partner in TAB down in San Diego, Tanya Scott, who is an exit strategy expert, she, she calls an intentional, he calls this an intentional exit. And, and listen, I've been unintendedly um, uh, exited before and it's not good, believe me. You want to avoid that. And I, I never said I was perfect. I learned from my mistakes. But think about some stats here. Retiring baby boomers outnumber those reaching age 45 by 4,000 a day. And as baby boomers start to retire, there's just not enough buyers out there. They outnumber those reaching age 45 by 4,000 a day. There's, there's, it's a giant, giant void. And moreover, millennials and Gen Xers they're carrying a lot more debt because of all their educational loans. And they don't have the money to purchase a business. So if you're a business owner today and you're thinking about exiting, sometime in the next 5, 10, 15 years, you better start talk, working on some of these principles we talked about today to build the value of your business because it's the, it's the best businesses that are going to achieve the highest sale ratio and will be the most attractive to a potential buyer. So in the elements of a, of a good exit, and Bo Burlingame, uh, who wrote the book Finishing Big, he identifies the, those elements as owners that feel they've been treated fairly during the exit process, they're at peace with their former employees, They've discovered a new sense of purpose outside of their business that they got something to do other than work. Some of the other keys in exiting business on your terms include building a business that can be sold when and to whom you want to sell it to. Let me put that in simpler terms. You have to be dispensable. The business cannot be you completely relying on you, the CEO or the business owner. 
the keys to this business have to be dispersed. It has to be able to run itself. And if you don't have a culture and a process and a strategy today for this business to run independently of you, you're limiting your ability to sell that, that business and you're limiting the, the price tag of which you can draw from that business. You got to start working on that down. So that's, that's it for what I can cover today. Here's some other timeless business principles just to touch on them. It's just a sampling. Getting the right people on the bus and more importantly, getting them on the right seats. Another one is running your business like a franchise, which takes you to having processes. Processes and maybe even in fostering an entrepreneurial culture. Again, this goes back to that self-sufficiency of your business. Another one, achieving a balance. A balance between work and your outside interests. You got to have some outside interest. You got to have a work-life balance. Our members find that they, they receive from their participation in the tab boards a huge amount of value. A huge amount of value from the other owners who they know run their businesses pretty well. And that's pretty priceless. And if you're listening to this show, this podcast, you're listening for a reason. There are lots of business owners out there that are perfectly content running a small, comfortable business. But there's a, more of you out there that want to achieve greater things. And you're probably one of those if you're listening right now. And one of the ways to achieve greater, greater things for your business, I can point you in the right directions. Tab can help you with this. And if you'd like to learn more about these principles and the value of a Tab membership, the alternative board, I'd love to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting at your office. We can even talk on the phone if you want to. We can talk about your business, explain what we do, see if it's a good fit. So our value proposition, our value prop can be summed up in, in an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I'm hoping that a few nuggets out of today's discussion will help you and your business. Thank you so much. I appreciate your, your sticking with me through all this. If you want some accountability, join a tab board. If you want somebody else to talk to, get advice from, join a tab board. That's what I do. So follow me on Twitter, at VC Sigmund. LinkedIn, Fawn Sigmund again. YouTube, Fawn Sigmund, the business mechanic. At, you know, we're recording the show. It goes live. We record it. We post it every week. Subscribe if you're there. Contact me through my website, vsigma.com, or you can email me at Vaughn, that's V-A-U-G-H-N, at vsigma, V is in Victor, S is in Sam, I-G-M-O-N, Vaughn at vsigma.com. I also want to let you know I've got some really awesome workshops that my team is putting together right now with me. And we're going to start doing some weekend collaborative leadership workshops. They are going to be game changers. Look for those in September. Thank you all for joining me today. And we'll talk to you next week.